I'd like to talk today about eugenia and dysgenia, eugenics and dysgenics. And I would submit to you that any policy, almost any policy, no matter what it's about or what it is, is either going to be eugenic or dysgenic, and objectively so. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that um, it's not a matter of opinion. It's not a matter of subjective evaluation. It's not a matter of, oh, well, I like these traits better than those traits, or I would prefer people to be this way rather than that way. We can say that a policy is objectively dysgenic if it undermines or attacks or erodes or selects against the very traits and qualities which make it possible for that policy to be carried into effect. So, for example, if we had a policy of feeding anybody who couldn't feed themselves, that policy would be objectively dysgenic. And that's not... Um, too different from many policies we actually do have. And the reason we can say that it's objectively dysgenic is because logically the only way to carry such a policy into effect, feeding anybody who can't feed themselves, is to take from the surpluses of people who can feed themselves and who generate surpluses uh, in order to feed the others. And if we do that, we're imposing a cost on people who can feed themselves and generate surpluses. In evolutionary terms, we're punishing people who can feed themselves and generate surpluses. And we're rewarding people who can't. We're turning not being able to feed yourself into a viable survival strategy, into a, an evolutionary niche, a profitable evolutionary niche. Um, and so by doing that, we're causing its prevalence, uh, the prevalence of not being able to feed yourself to rise. Um, even as by punishing being able to feed yourself and generate surpluses, we're causing the prevalence of that to fall. So we're selecting against um, the qualities that enable the policy to be carried into effect. We're proliferating... Um, the qualities that impose costs on the policy um, and upon the people who are punished in order to carry the policy into effect. Um, so that policy is going to break down. We're going we're gonna to proliferate the unable and we're going to tax the able until um, you know there are just too many unable for the able to feed and it's going to break down uh, and there's going to be hunger and, uh, you know, mass, mass starvation on a scale that um, had not been seen before. So that's an objectively dysgenic policy. It tends to undermine the conditions and the qualities, um, which would even enable it to be put into effect. Now, in contrast, there might be some objectively eugenic policies, and I think there were a lot of these in the past. Um, one of them is the, um, the institution of marriage and the nuclear family in Northwest European cultures. Uh, husband, house bond, literally means homeowner. Traditionally, a man wouldn't marry until he had his own home. And this established sort of like a minimum bar uh, for reproduction because... Um, sex outside of marriage was also prohibited. So, you know, you got to get your shit together to a certain point, at least to be able to get a home. And then you can marry and then you can reproduce. That's a minimum bar. Uh, and that is objectively eugenic because it's not going to break down. You're selecting for the characteristics that uh, um, you're rewarding. Uh you know, the payoff, if you get your shit together, if you get to reproduce, that's a reward in evolutionary terms. And, um, you know, the, the policy is not going to break down because you're selecting for that characteristic. You know, people are just going to keep getting better if you impose that eugenic filter.
uh, it's never gonna it's never gonna break down. You're selecting for people with the qualities of being able to get their shit together to the point of reaching that minimum bar and uh, participating in reproduction. And so those qualities are gonna increase in prevalence, not decrease. And uh, and the policy is gonna become easier and easier to enforce, not more and more difficult and costly to enforce. Another example of an objectively eugenic policy uh, would be the manorial system. So under feudalism, land was divided into manors, and there would be a lord of the manor, and um, he would further subdivide the land and lease portions of it to peasants, uh, you know, various kinds of uh, tenants, yeomen, farmers, or villains, or you know, I'm not 100%, you know, up to snuff on the details, but there are different kinds of tenancy, and in in selecting tenants for his lands, the Lord is trying to, he wants his lands to produce, um, because that's good for him. He gets a share of the produce, and it's good for his estate. And um, so he's selecting four sturdy peasants, dependable, industrious, thrifty, hardworking um, reliable, sturdy peasants. And that's, that's an objectively eugenic policy. It's another filtering criteria or selection criteria. But, um, you know, he's not giving the land out to the village drunk or the village idiot. Um, he's selecting dependable peasants. And under this selection regime, you know, the quality of the peasantry is, is only going to go up. It's not going to break down. You're not, uh, you're rewarding um, subjectively eugenic because the policy itself is selecting for the criteria or the qualities or the traits or the characteristics that enable the policy to operate. So, you know, it's not going to break down. The peasantry is going to improve. The productivity of the land is going to improve. Um, things just keep getting better. Uh, maybe one other uh, example of this that I kind of just learned about recently. In, in olden times, women who could afford it, wealthy women, would often hire a wet nurse for their children. And this would allow them to stop breastfeeding sooner, which in turn would allow them to become fertile sooner and have more children. So they would hire the wet nurse, they would stop breastfeeding, um, that would result in earlier resumption of fertility and therefore an increased frequency and number of, of children. And in the meantime, the poorer women they're hiring to, to wet nurse their children, you know, this is going to delay their resumption of fertility because there's a, there's a cessation of fertility um, while lactating oftentimes for, you know, some period of time. So if you're extending the, uh, the breastfeeding of, of poor mothers, you're delaying the onset of fertility and you're, you're decreasing the number of offspring that they have. Uh, and if you're cutting short the, um, you know, breastfeeding of the, of the wealthy mother, you're enabling her to have more children. So a wealthy woman who could afford wet nurses might have 15 or 20 children and a, you know, a poorer woman might have five to seven and um, somebody's a full-time wet nurse, you know, they might have even less than that. So that that's a eugenic policy because, um, you know, selecting for people uh, who have the characteristics, who have the traits of uh, generating surpluses sufficient to hire a wet nurse. And that system's not going to, that's not going to cause the policy to break down it could, I guess, kind of break down if um, people become wealthy enough that there aren't enough poor left to offer that service of wet nursing. Um, but that's not a catastrophic failure. that just kind of fades out. Uh, the policy itself selects for, you know, criteria that, uh, you know, it's not going to break down catastrophically like, say, feeding deadbeats will. You know, you know it might 
it might evolve out of existence, but it's not going to break down catastrophically. Now, why does all this matter? Um, well, if you've ever seen Idiocracy, you kind of know where this can go. And um, we used to have all these eugenic traditions, policies, uh, customs, practices, and a lot of them have been undermined or eroded or flipped upside down in the last century or so. And um, if you've ever seen the movie Idiocracy, you kind of know where this can go. And it's not good. Uh, because the dysgenic policies that have been put in place are going to break down eventually. They're going to break down catastrophically, and there's going to be great suffering, misery, ruin, chaos as a result. Um, so, there's been some debate as to whether this is going on. One piece of counter evidence is the so called Flynn effect, where IQs have kind of been going up ever since IQ testing was introduced, you know, a century or so ago. And they've had to keep renorming the tests to keep the average at 100. So people have been going back and forth. Is this actually representative of a, a rise in raw intelligence? And um, there's a good TED talk by Flynn himself, the guy that the Flynn effect is named after. You can go check it out. Maybe I'll post a link in the comments or in the description. And uh, basically Flynn comes to the conclusion that people are getting better at taking the tests or doing the kinds of thinking that the test measures, but it's not necessarily representative of a, uh, of a rise in raw intelligence. And the best evidence we have to the contrary of that is from reaction times, studies of reaction times. And... Um, They've been measuring visual reaction times for over a century, since the late 19th century, um, when we got chronometers accurate enough to do this, where you flash some kind of stimulus, you know, a light or a flag or something, and you measure how long it takes for people to respond, to press a button or whatever. And um, during this century, century and a half that we've been measuring this, Reaction times have gone up, meaning people are getting slower from something like 0.15 to 0.17 seconds in the late Victorian age to uh, you know 0.25 seconds on average today in the West, and that means people are getting slower. So you know Nintendo generation notwithstanding, people's reaction times are slower than they used to be, and that correlates with intelligence. If you look at the relationship between reaction times intelligence nowadays and as measured by an IQ test and you extrapolate that backwards in time we're looking at a loss of intelligence of something like 15 points of IQ a whole standard deviation more than a point per decade for over a century of loss in IQ and this has been approximately since uh since the introduction of contraception, because that was mainly, probably the main thing that flipped the traditional uh, correlation between wealth and success and fertility. The traditional positive correlation between wealth and success and fertility flipped it upside down, made it a negative correlation, because now we're breeding our underclasses, we're breeding our poor, our wretched, our fuck-ups, and not, um, you know, the more successful and productive and high agency, got it together kind of portions of the population are largely refraining from reproduction. Uh, and that's bad. I don't know how much we can do about that. One thing we can do is we can oppose the explicitly dysgenic policies that have become fashionable during that century. You know, the socialism, the feminism, the, uh, the uh, explicitly dysgenic egalitarianism, redistribution, those kind of policies, we can oppose those policies and uh, hopefully maybe institute um, more eugenic ones in their place. And, uh, you know, that doesn't seem to be happening, and it may not happen anytime soon, but that's going to be what has to be done. And, uh, you know, if you want to see why, again, check out Idiocracy. Um, but I would submit to you that any policy, no matter what it's about, is either eugenic or dysgenic. And the eugenic ones are not the most problematic.